Welcome Transformation Talk Radio listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart and I am the pushy broad from the Bronx. She's the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York. Follow her voice, a straight dog is nice. She's the pushy broad from the Bronx, oh yeah. Don't be surprised if you want to listen twice. Make decisions, find the right choice. Know yourself better, find your own voice. It's okay if you need help today, cause everybody needs a little push. From the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York. I am so delighted to introduce to you someone that I have admired for years, and I am going to introduce her the way she introduces herself. This woman describes herself as an author, a speaker, and a former sports agent. It is my honor and privilege to have a conversation with Molly Fletcher. Good morning, Molly. Good morning. (laughs) It's good to be with you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for being here today. As we discussed earlier, I wanted to talk to you about how you got to where you are today. So if we could do a little bit of an introspective into your beginnings, talk to me about your family in Michigan growing up. Yeah, you know, um, so I'm still just forever at 49 almost, as you said earlier, forever grateful to my parents. Um, You know, I grew up in a really loving home with uh, two parents who really put their children, you know, much before everything else in their life, um, but not before each other. And they were, uh, you know, had a strong marriage and strong commitment to each other. Um, you know, my mom was a school teacher, a, a speech pathologist in the Lansing Public Schools for years and years, 30, 40 years. And my dad was a pharmaceutical sales rep. And then we have, I had two older, I have two older brothers who are five years older than me. And and, um, you know, so it was, a, it was a home where there was so much encouragement, lots and lots of discipline. You know, my dad was sort of tough, but you could sit on his lap and have a bowl of popcorn too. Um, and they had to spend a lot of time keeping their eyes on my crazy brothers who were, you know, just mischievous boys, you know, not doing anything awful, but, you know, picking flowers from the neighbor's garden and you know, building campfires in the basement. And so they had their eye on them a little bit more than me. And so, um, but the love was there and the commitment was there. And, and they treat, my brothers treated me a lot more like a little brother than a little sister. I think that's why I was probably a good bit of a tomboy growing up super, you know, much more comfortably being outside playing basketball with them or uh, climbing a tree than, you know, uh, inside playing with dolls. That's for sure. I understand. My first ball, uh, my first toy was a Spalding ball. Yeah, there you go. Right. And my dad used to have eight uh, eight millimeter uh, movies of me just bouncing that ball. And all the other girls around me were playing with dolls. And here I am bouncing a ball. And and dad, I think my dad wanted uh, a a boy. So he taught me all of those sports, just like your brothers, right? Sure. Baseball, basketball, football, um, and of course, tennis. So sure. There you go. Good. good. So did you start playing tennis in high school? You know, I, it, it's a kind of a fun personal story. I, I uh, We had a little tiny cabin up about an hour and a half north of, of Lansing where I grew up. And we would drive up north to this little cabin that was, um, it was really pretty gross, to be honest. <laughs> but we would go up there to this little lake and And uh, we would go play tennis um, as a family, but that was five. And so I was the ball girl. And so I got relegated to the ball girl. And, you know, they would say, you know, you just pick up the balls and you can be the ball girl um, because we make an even four. And I remember so distinctly sitting at this park near our cottage. And I, I remember at the end, after being just sort of tired of chasing after their tennis balls for an hour or two, I looked at them and I said, I just want to let you guys know one of these days I'll be beating every single one of you in tennis. And they were like, whatever, you know, and I was probably, I don't know, 10 or 11 maybe. And by 13 or 14, I was beating them all and had just fallen in love with the game. And, um, you know, so I, I really, I started competitively at like 13 or 14, which in the environment that we live in today is so late, right? You see so many kids specialize so early. Um, But the gift in that was when I got to Michigan state to play, I still had a lot of room to get better. Uh, I mean, I loved the game. I always, you know, I would ride my bike to practice if my parents couldn't take me. I just felt so safe 
uncomfortable really on a tennis court. It was just a home away from home for me. And, you know, I, I, I'm just forever grateful for, for the sport of tennis because it gave me so much opportunity. Um, and so I'm super grateful for, for that. And I'm sure that tennis in itself, I know playing the game as well with a racket in my hand at seven, um, also won a contest to play tennis with Jimmy Connors, which I did, which is cool. absolutely amazing. I bet. The, the discipline that it takes to play the game and the singular focus that it takes to play that game. And I'm sure that was certainly something that has taken you into the rest of your life. Sure. So here you are, graduated from uh, Michigan State, and you have decided that all of a sudden you will pack yourself up with just a couple of bucks in your pocket and hustle it down to Atlanta. Yeah. Why Atlanta and why then? What was, what was drawing you to it? Yeah, you know, uh, so I'll never forget, I was sitting in, in the den at my parents' house with two of my friends from high school. And we were gonna, you know, we were, we were still really close and, and uh, we sort of looked at each other and pulled out a map, I remember so distinctly, and sort of we're sitting there and we're like, man, we could go to like Aspen and, you know, run chairlifts. And my dad would kind of go, yeah, no, we, you just got a degree. You're not going to Aspen to ski and goof around. You know, or, uh, you know, we go oh, Chicago, lots of people from Michigan State went to Chicago. We could, and, and then one of my friends was also kind of an athlete and we said, gosh, you know, well, God, I mean, the Atlanta, the Super Bowl's coming to Atlanta, the Olympics is coming. You know, there seems to be a lot of opportunity in sports, which was the area I felt like I wanted to focus on, although I wasn't totally clear. And so she got a job with the Atlantic Committee for the Olympic Games and moved down to Atlanta. One of my other friends bailed and decided to stay in Lansing. And I ended up saying, you know what, I'm going to just try it. And so she had a job. I didn't. Um, but she had settled into an apartment um, in Atlanta and I, and I just packed up, I, you know, I had about 2000 bucks. I taught tennis all summer to save money to try to move to Atlanta because my parents were amazing, but they weren't going to fund my little excursion to find my dream job in Atlanta. I mean, we were a middle-class family and that was not in the cards. And so, and, and part of the why around it, I think was, you know, I am and was so close to my mom and dad that there was moments looking back that it almost scared me because I thought, I don't know what it would look like if I ever had to live without them. And so I thought, I need to make sure I can. I think it was somewhat subconscious, right? Like, I think I need to go there to make sure that I can do some things on my own and not feel so connected because I you know, grew up in East Lansing, then went to Michigan State, and I would come home a lot and study. I was in a sorority, but, you know, girls would be out partying, and, <laughs> and I would need to, to wake up early for a tennis match. So a lot of times before matches, I'd go home and sleep. And, you know, and my parents were amazing, but they were like, look, if we're paying for you to live in a dorm or a sorority, then go live in the dorm or the sorority. If you want to live at home, you can live at home, but right now we're paying for food at two places, and we don't have that in the cards. And I finally got a scholarship my junior and senior year, so that was cool. But but so, uh, you know, the why around it was probably somewhat subconscious. Um, I was young enough that I could do it, right? I had no uh, reason that I couldn't, no kids, no, you know, I mean, so all that stuff. And um, so I got down to Atlanta with 2000 bucks in my pocket and, and lived in the apartment complex on the couch of my friend from high school that had already been a little bit ahead of me until I could find a job. And, and you know, the story gets sort of longer and more crazy and more interesting, but <laughs> I'll pause there, but that was sort of the why and, and, and the whole deal. Okay, so here you are now, un, um, lucky enough to find some work at ESPN, correct? Or at least a division of ESPN. How exactly did that come about? You must have had a lot of doubts. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of moxie, the kind of guts you must have had. I mean, even in the, you know, the, the middle 90s, let's say, let's put it, yeah. let's put it uh, there, where yeah. you, you've decided as a woman, did you just walk into the, a division of ESPN and say, hey, it's me, I'm Very Molly nice. the Pushy Broad, give me a job. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, you know, one of the things that I talk about this in my book, Fearless at Work, but, I, you know, I really believe sort of little moments build up into big moments. And that's why I always encourage women, you know, just take little steps, whatever those are for you, but take little steps. And, and, and the more little steps we take, the more comfortable we get, you know, to your, to your sort of name of your podcast, right? Being pushy, right? And so 
I, um, you know, I think that, that being a student athlete helped. I think big brothers helped. I think encouraging parents helped. All those things help give you confidence. And so when I got down to Atlanta, I needed to move out of my friend's apartment because it was 600 square feet. And so I had negotiated a deal to teach tennis in exchange for my rent at an apartment complex. And, you know, that took a little bit of pressure off me because now I'd removed what would, would have been a huge expense, right? I had a car payment and, and, and really food, right? And I would eat my way through grocery stores. I would have grapes. I would have, you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to wash the grapes, I promise. It. You're not going to drop dead. And so, you know, I, I sort of, and so I, I had, you know, a little bit of time and, and I had this philosophy, you know, that, that sort of when you ask for advice, you get a job. And when you ask for a job, you get advice. And, 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 and this mindset of how do I get somebody to like and respect me enough to want to help me or hire me, right? Like, how do I get them to like and respect me enough to take my call again um, and or to want to kind of be my agent to help me find, you know, an opportunity and, and, and I thought, you know, if, if every person I meet with, I can do that with, and, and then maybe they would help me by giving me three more names and three more names and three more names. You know, then in a minute, I remember, you know, this is 93, right? So I had this card catalog in front of me, right? Not, uh, you know, LinkedIn or contacts on our computer. So I had this card catalog of all these cards and, you know, pretty quickly I had like 20 or 30 plus relationships that I was able to, to, to lean into. And, you know, to try to get them to help me enough to hire me. And, and uh, so through that networking opportunity, I got an opportunity with, um, it, it was a division of ESPN called Intellimedia and we, and we sold CD-ROMs to um, sports manufacturers, et, et cetera. So my role was we had 16 different CD-ROMs at the time that were sports specific. And I would run around the country and call on, you know, sports authority. I, I don't even think Dix was around, but local retailers, all that kind of stuff to try to, to try to sell it. Um, so, you know, again, that, that was, uh, it, it was a fun journey, but it was, it was a journey of, you know, asking, being curious, listening, um, building respect, you know, not giving up, networking my head off, <laughs> not being afraid of, of different things. I remember going to church one day and there was a woman that spoke and, and, uh, or no, maybe it was rotary, but anyway, she was up in the front of the room and, and the room was 90% men. And she was this really cool, strong woman. And she got up and, and delivered a message, um, on, on safety with baseballs actually. And so she gets up in front, she delivers this. And, and then, um, I, I was just blown away at how she got up and delivered in front of all these men. And she was so strong. And, you know, again, I sort of leaned into her after and tried to get her to like and respect me enough to help me. And, you know, she would help me with my resume on the side and, and help me navigate different opportunities. And, you know, and so, you know, I, I believe it starts with people. It starts with relationships. It starts with connection. It starts with authenticity. Um, and that was what I always just tried to do. And, and slowly but surely, you continue to navigate your way through this world. Certainly a sense of genuineness and fearlessness in, in the way that you're going to put it all out there. You're going to expose yourself for who you are and be the person that you would want somebody to like. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, no is just feedback, right? I think, I think no is just an opportunity to potentially to pivot, to get more curious to figure out what the gap is. I mean, when I was an agent, the number of no's I got was enormous. But the number of times those no's turned into yeses, and then you're at their weddings, and you're there when their babies are born, and you know, you're there when they sign their first you know, multi-year, multi-million dollar deal. It begins to give you the confidence to know that you can turn no's into yeses in an authentic way and serve people in a way that you both look back and smile at those moments when they said, man, I never thought this would end this way, but I'm really glad it did. It's, it's cool. It's a wonderful thing. I, I know I can see it in the success that you've had and I can see how you inspire others. I was al always told that every single no leads you closer to a yes. Yes. So I would welcome as many no's I could possibly get because I knew it was going to be a windfall when somebody finally said yes. Yeah. So that's how you started in ESPN. And then you evolved into the cliche of your life, the Jerry Maguire of, of female sports agents. And I know that will follow you forever. Explain to us how you got that break and what that world was like breaking in there and the resistance you got. 
yeah. by being a woman in this field. That's what we want to know. Yeah, sure. You know, so I got the opportunity at a small agency in Atlanta where we had about three or four clients, a couple NBA coaches and a baseball player. And the, the guy that ran the agency hired me to um, go get endorsement deals and, and, and for the athletes that we had and, and for the athlete and the coach that we had. And it was during the Olympics. So um, I, Lenny Wilkins was a client of ours and he was the uh, head coach of the Atlanta Dream Team, um, the Olympic team. And so I spent initially, right when I got into this job, most of my time driving Lenny around, Wilkins around from one appearance to the next, which was super fun and cool because I got to be with, you know, a guy that's now in the Hall of Fame as not just a player, but a coach and also a remarkable man, a wonderful human being. And so I was his driver, right, for two weeks, but I had the opportunity to shadow him and be beside him and anticipate his needs and support him at all of these different appearances. Mm. Um, and, and, and obviously got to meet a lot of the players through that window of time. And, and, and then after the Olympics settled out, you know, my job was to go get, you know, whether it was free dry cleaning deals to, you know, sunglass trade out deals to autograph appearances, to baseball card signings, to grand opening autograph sign, all that kind of stuff. And I'll never forget. I was in my office. I was sorting through these sunglass sunglasses that I had, had gotten um, from a corporate sponsor and, and, and some lanyards that we had, to, you know, and so I'm sitting in my office and I remember thinking, you know, how are we going to grow this place? Like, how are we going to get more clients, more athletes? Because that's where the revenue is. That's where the opportunity to serve is. That's where the opportunity to grow is. It felt like to me in, in a more significant, more interesting, more influential way for the athletes and coaches. And so I walked into the CEO's office and I said, Hey, what's our growth plan? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I mean, how are we getting more clients, right? Like, how did you get the ones we have and what's our plan to get more? And he said, referrals. He said, it's been amazing. He said, Lenny referred Mike Fratello and Chuck Daly referred. And, you know, he's going through this whole thing. And I said, cool. And I said, well, have you, you know, what if we got more aggressive? And he said, the referrals have been, you know, pretty, pretty awesome, right? He had a pretty, pretty big brand and reputation in the NBA coaching space. And so, well, gosh, we have a baseball player. What if we got more aggressive? I mean, you know, I knew Georgia Tech had a great baseball program. I knew Georgia did. And you know, we had a couple minor league teams, certainly the Atlanta Braves. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, like if I went down and, and recruited some of these baseball players that we could sign it when they were drafted. And then of course, represent them through. And he said, well, it, you know, and I said, can I just put a business plan together and show you what this might look like? And he said, sure, go for it. Right. And I'm sure he thought, well, well this is going to be interesting because <laughs> I didn't play in the big leagues. I didn't play in the minor leagues. I didn't play college baseball. Right. I, and, and I didn't go to a lot of baseball games as a kid, right? So, and uh, so I put a plan together and he said, go for it. So literally within weeks, I was down at Georgia Tech and I would lean on that fence because they had a couple projected high round draft picks coming out that year. And I would lean on that fence with scouts, you know, with stopwatches and chewing tobacco and bubble gum and parents and coaches. And I really got to know Danny Hall, the head coach of Georgia Tech men's baseball team. And he was a great guy. He is a great guy. And and Danny liked me and wanted to help me. It was sort of this philosophy, right, of get them to respect you enough to help you. Or, And so Danny was able to sort of help put me in the room with a couple of the high draft round guys that were projected that year. And I signed a couple guys um, that year that were coming out in the draft. And again, you know, I had a kid that signed and, you know, but this was new to me, right, learning where they were slotted, what they should be paid, um, and I leaned into the baseball player that we had. I leaned into building relationships with the scouts so that they would trust me, but they would help me um, as well. And um, so I signed a couple guys that year and then a couple more the next year. And then they would get into the minor league system and I would go see them in Raleigh, Durham and all these different small markets. And I would get them, you know, to dinner and say, bring your buddy, you know, bring your buddy to dinner. And they'd bring another second rounder or another first rounder to dinner. And then I'd sort of try to listen and get them to respect me enough to know that I could help them. And then I'd find their gaps. And then, you know, so long story short, right, that evolved to a place where I had, you know, probably 20, 15, 20 guys and 50% of first round guys don't even make it. And so one of my guys that I had signed didn't make it to the big leagues. And, but I loved him. He went to North Carolina. He was a wonderful guy. And I said, Hey, I'm trying to grow this baseball division. Would you consider coming in to help us grow it? And he could fill a gap for me, right? He could, talk about the minor league bus ride from Durham to Houston and making eight grand a year and the double switch in the bottom of the sixth and the, the manager and the hitting order and all the stuff that I hadn't done. Um, so I hired him to come help me grow the baseball division. And, you know, and then I sort of went in and did the same thing, right? Like let, let's do this with golf. 
let's go, right? So did it, we go, and so, you know, 18 years later, 300 athletes and coaches, I'll, I'll zip it now, but <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, it's to your point, it's, it's about having the courage to ask for what you want, but I also think it's important to have internal advocates. I mean, the, the, the agency that I worked for, I had tremendous support from the leader, and that was a big deal, and, and it wouldn't have worked without his support. I mean, I'll never forget sitting in the boardroom and Isaiah Thomas was a client, comes in and sits down and we start talking. And, and it was just the three of us, our leader and myself. And, and Isaiah kind of looked at uh, the guy that I work for and he said, hey, you know, she probably doesn't want to hear this. <laughs> she probably needs to go. And he looked at Isaiah and looked at me and I kind of, you know, looked at him and he looked back at Isaiah and he goes, she knows everything. She ain't leaving. And, you know, there was moments like that where we'd go in and negotiate contracts and he brought me with him at 26 years old when I had done a lot of work to prepare for the conversation. I had potentially managed the relationship in different So I was closer to the player, but, you know, he could have left me out of those conversations. I mean, he shouldn't have at all, but could he have in the environment, in the world that, yes, I mean, he was the leader, you know. But I would go and I would talk a lot and I would contribute in significant ways. And, and for that, I'm grateful, right? I think as women, we need women and men to help each other, to lift each other up, to put each other in the rooms together, to invite women to pull a chair up at the boardroom table, not sit on the side. I mean, we as women have to do that for other women, but certainly men who lead women have to do that for women. Um, because the conversation changes and the conversation gets better. And I think the service to the customer improves in significant ways. I absolutely agree with you. I want to know if you think that things have evolved and changed to, to, today. Do you think there is more respect for women in professions that are normally dominated by men? You know, I, I think it's a work in progress. I mean, are we there? No. Uh, can we get there? Yes. But there is a whole lot of room for improvement. I mean, I think we see it in the financial space. We see it in the tech arena. We certainly see it in sports still. And, you know, continuing to promote women, to continuing to promote and, and invite women to the conversation and recognize the ways in which they can contribute um, is significant. So, uh, you know, we, we need to continue to get more women on boards. We need to continue to get more women in the C-suite and there's pockets of progress and there's pockets of gaps. And uh, I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to lean into the conversation, um, to embrace uh, supporting one another. I mean, I think, you know, uh, women, you know, it's so important for us as women to support other women. One of my favorite things to do is to, to lean into other women who want to get in the sports space and try to support them and, and encourage them that you can do this. You can represent male athletes and support them in incredible ways or women who want to speak, which is where I spend a lot of time now, supporting them, helping them sort of pave that path for them. I think it's about having this abundant mindset versus sort of this finite mindset. When we have an abundant mindset, we believe that there's room for all of us uh, inside of these moments in these conversations. And that's interesting you say that because you come from a very competitive world and being competitive, one would sometimes think that makes it finite because you're yeah. narrowing things down. But what you're talking about here is opening things up and you keep talking about leaning into people. And I think that part of that for you and correct me if I'm wrong is to understand the adaptability of things and your flexibility, I think also enabled you to break into a world that would normally keep you out by not only asking for respect, but by paying that respect yeah. towards the people that you were with. No question. And I think you've got to have a clear, you know, in, in order to lean into these moments, in order to navigate the multiple speed bumps that you're going to get along the way, the, the no's, you've got to have a clear why. You've got to have a clear purpose. Because what that does is it helps you navigate all the speed bumps. If you're, if you're clear on the impact you can make in this space, if you're clear on why you want to do it, and it's for the right reasons, you'll be able to endure the speed bumps, right? It's the, it's the minor league guys that I saw who believed and could visualize themselves on the mound in an all-star game. 
who could visualize themselves, you know, pitching in game seven of a world series. It, it, it was those guys who could deal with the rehab for a year from an ACL who could deal with all the tough moments, the 0 for 24 streaks at the, at the plate, but they believed that they could do it. And so they would visualize that and it would take them through those speed bumps. And I think we all as women need that. We all as people need that because it allows us to continue to navigate the challenges because when we're fearless, right? When we're pushing ourselves, it isn't always going to go right, right? Like I didn't get every guy I went after, you know, like it didn't always go great. There was lots of moments that were super hard, but the more clear we are on why we do what we do, the more clear we are on the contribution we believe we can make, uh, the, the, the more we can endure the, the, the challenges along the way, which there will be. So you've got to expect them, right? And, and then recover fast from them. Absolutely. It's the adaptability and the flexibility and the inevitability of embracing change. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, one of the to stories I tell in, in my keynotes a lot is John Smoltz was a client. He was a, a pitcher for the Atlanta Braves. He's a Hall of Famer. He now does TV. Uh, and, and, you know, John was a starter who then converted to a closer, not because he had to, but because he wasn't afraid of change. He wasn't afraid to get uncomfortable. He wasn't afraid to, to deal with that the pressure, he wanted the ball when it was tight and then went back to the starting role, right? Like, so a hundred percent, he leaned into change. And I saw that over and over again with the best athletes in the world is, um, you know, they leaned into change and, and here we are in a world where there is a whole lot of change, but when we can step into the gifts in the change, when we can step into what we know can allow us to come out a little bit better um, when, when we change and when we adapt, we evolve. And, and, and I think it makes life a whole lot more interesting. Uh, but, but what that means is you have to enjoy the process. You know, I'm a big believer that, uh, you know, like for me, for tennis, I love practice. I love hitting on the ball machine, hitting on the wall, grabbing a hopper of balls and going to work on my serve. I love that as much or more than I love competing. And I think that, in order to be great at anything, you've got to love the process. You can't just look at the shiny object that's out in front of you as the outcome. We've got to embrace the process and navigate that. And as you said, always keeping your why in the forefront. So I talked to you earlier and I asked you if you'd be kind enough to share your why with us. Would you be kind enough to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. And we talked about this, right? Like, I think this is really important for people. And, uh, you know, we do this um, as an organization, we lead companies through gaining clarity around, around purpose. Um, and, and I think it's really important. And, you know, it's funny because companies have mission statements, right? Like it's almost like this badge of honor to open your doors. You've got to get that plaque up on the wall with the mission statement. And, and, and how many of them actually make sure they filter all their decisions through that mission statement and how many don't. And, and to me, it's not just about the fancy, you know, silver sort of, you know, lines on the wall. What matters is do you live that, right? Do you stand for that? And so it's interesting to me, it always has been that the companies have mission statements, but as people, we should too, right? Because it becomes our guiding sort of light at some level and, and um, allows us to filter our decisions through it. So I spent a lot of time um, to try to get clear on this. And mine is to lead, inspire, and connect with courage and optimism. And so whether it's speaking engagements, whether it's new book opportunities, whether it's even you know, all the different work that we do, it's always about filtering it through that and saying, is, is this gonna allow me to fulfill the ability to lead, inspire, and connect? And if it is, then let's do it. If it's not, let's take a pass. That is certainly it's inspiring. And the fact that you look to do it every single day keeps you singular, singularly focused. And that's a wonderful thing. We talk, you talked about change. And I want to talk a little bit about what happens to women specifically as they get older and they begin to reinvent themselves. As marvelous as your career was at being a sports agent, uh, give us an idea of when that came to an end and how you pivoted into another direction, seizing other opportunities. Yeah. So, Alan, you know, in the spirit of kind of the why, um, you know, I wrote a book. Um, it, I wrote my first book to help young people find tough jobs because I was recruiting athletes while kids were trying to sort of 
meet with me about being a sports agent and I saw a gap in the way they were doing it and what I found to be working recruiting athletes. And I felt like that process was similar. So I wrote a book about that and, um, and I enjoyed that process. And then, you know, sort of maybe 10, 15 years into the sports agent business, I began to see that, you know, Ernie Johnson Jr. on, on TNT wasn't that dissimilar to John Smoltz and Smoltz wasn't that much dissimilar to, you know, Tom Izzo and, and, and Lenny Wilkins and, you know, and so I began to sort of say a lot of the mindset of these athletes and women that we worked with, broadcasters, Aaron Andrews, I saw, you know, it, it's not that dissimilar, right? The way they all think, the way they behave, the way they prepare, the way they recover, the way they anticipate, the way they deal with change, it's pretty similar. And I think this could help people. So I'm going to write another book about it. And so I wrote a book called The Business of Being the Best. And that was more targeted toward business people. And that book did pretty well. And, and so then my phone started ringing with companies saying, hey, will you come and speak about your book to our national sales meeting or our national company, you know, whatever. And so I did. And I said, absolutely. And so one day, I'll never forget, I, I, I ran out at lunch, spoke across the street from our office at a pretty big convention center that was across the street at, a, at an event that they had asked me to come speak at. And I ran over there and literally spoke. And at the end, this lady came up to me and she'd written 80 books and speaks all over the place, mm -hmm. Robin Spiesman. And she said, you need to do this. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? And she said, no, you like, you need to do this. This is what you need to do. And I said, dude, I got, I got nine agents, 300 athletes. I mean, like I'm killing it. This is a blast. I don't know. What do you mean? And she goes, you need to do this all the time. And I was like, oh, wow, what? And so I go back and, and she said, let's just go to lunch. So we go to lunch and she said, look, just do me a favor. Just, just take a website, put your bio on it and just have a place where people can go. And, and I said, okay, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting paid. This is a full-time job plus, plus, plus. And, and so long story short, you know, the phone kind of kept ringing and I'd go speak at Mass Mutual and Northwestern Mutual and Bank of America and Merrill Lynch, primarily there. And then there'd be people in the back of the room and it just became a word of mouth thing. And then I found myself at a place where I really needed to make a decision. And I was feeling so much fulfillment from speaking because I felt like the messaging uh, from my world as a female in the sports space was really connecting to people, the, the behaviors and the traits that I'd seen from peak performers was translating well. It was helping people. It was different because it was a woman, you know, married at this time now with kids and, but was in the sports world. So she was sort of talking about sports and pitching and, you know, timeouts and, you know, last minute shots. And, and then she was talking about being pregnant, delivering three babies in 12 months. Like what? And so I, I found that, uh, I found that it was connecting candidly more with my purpose and I felt like um, it was making a difference in people's lives. And so I, I pulled back and I said, you know, I'm, I'm impacting 300 athletes and coded team of agents, but gosh, in one day with a room of a thousand people, you're impacting these thousand people plus, plus I feel like, you know, what do I want my legacy to be? What is my purpose really? And so it made absolutely no sense, right? I left this big salary and this team and all this stuff to go pursue, you know, I had like nine keynotes scheduled when I left for, you know, not a lot of money per, per keynote. And, you know, and so it, it was, um, it was, I wish I could say that it was a uh, very um, strategic, intentional pivot, but it was very organic and very natural. And I think, you know, I, I Arthur Blank, I interviewed for one of my books who owns the Atlanta Falcons and started the Home Depot. And Arthur told me once when I interviewed the, for, for the business of the bass, that book, he said, you know, Mal, remember, he goes, if you follow your heart and you close a gap in the world, you're probably going to make a difference and you're going to be happy doing it. And, and that's kind of what I did, right? I followed my heart and I tried to close a gap. And in many ways, you were ready for that transition. You just expressed that you had been doing this for a little over a decade. You were looking around you. You were seeing the things that were important, but not on a day-to-day -day level. You were taking a step back, looking at more intrinsically, looking at the whole picture, and gleaning from your experience 
what you yeah. could take with you to the next phase of your life. So this was a very easy flow, a very easy transition for you. And I do believe that we go in the direction that we're most comfortable with in that way. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's a God thing. I mean, it's yep. the way one goes to the next portion of their lives. Um, so the transition was, was easy. So, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, and I, I would say absolutely it was a God thing because you can't, you know, you can't, I mean, you can't do that on purpose, right? I mean, it was absolutely um, something greater than me. So I am, you know, just trying to sort of serve and fulfill that every day. Well, now with over 60 keynote speaking engagements a year and over 300,000 people at a clip reached, I think you're doing a really good job of making that easy transition. So um, would you consider yourself in some ways a pushy broad by my definition? <laughs> you know, I, I would say, well, what is your definition? I guess let's start there. Okay, well, my definition of being a pushy broad is somebody that is outspoken in a way that helps the rest of the world and is completely okay with exactly who she is and takes what she wants in order to be a better individual. That's my definition of a pushy broad. Pushy sure, broad. sure. <laughs> You know, um, you know, I would say uh, then I probably sit inside of that category. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, uh, I, th I think it's important to ask for what you want. And, you know, I think it's important. That was part of why we started Game Changer Negotiation Training. And, uh, you know, we do it just for women too, but is, is to help women learn how to ask for what they want. And, and I think that it's scary to ask for what you want because it can get messy. You worry about the relationship. But what I believe is if you build strong relationships on the front end and you ask with authenticity, with sincerity, um, you, you can ask for what you want and not risk impacting the relationship in a negative way. And I think part of the reason women tend to maybe not ask for what they want enough is they're, they're afraid of the zig and the zag that comes after that. Um, and, and that's why we believe and we teach that if you can build a strong connection on the front end, um, then asking for what you want can be done in a very safe, connected way um to your point and and so um so so yeah that's i so i guess i sit inside of that i, I would say there you go that's great and, and i know you talk about this too and i just want to touch on it briefly the zig and the zag i think i would describe as one of the key things you talk about in your speaking engagements and that's the art of negotiation yeah. and understanding i love what you wrote about the fact that men think of negotiation as winning a ball game and women think of it as going to the dentist and i have always thought about it as a good tennis match a hundred percent it is it is i mean it you know you're just rallying a little bit going back and forth and i i couldn't agree with you more i, I mean i think it is very much that way and and recognizing, um, you know, that the more that we practice, you know, one of the things I encourage people to do is just practice, practice in little moments, practice with the, you know, the, the, the guy that cuts your yard or, you know, practice at Starbucks, practice, just, just start practicing, asking for what you want, driving connection. And, and what I think you'll find is the more comfortable you get doing it in little moments, then, you know, the more comfortable that you'll get doing it in bigger moments. The, the easier it'll be when, when you, the more you practice in little moments, the easier it is to go in and have that conversation with your boss um, or, or with a customer, with a vendor. So I'm a big proponent of practice and then you'll get stronger in the bigger moments. And also, I think by your own personal experience, if somebody is making a negotiation, it's not that we're just asking for what we want. We're also contributing to that. So it's not just that we are taking but the art of negotiation is a give and take. So if 100%. One looks, right? So if one looks at it like, I'm not the only one in this position just asking for something. I'm also giving something. Yep. And that becomes valuable. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because so many people think, oh, as a sports agent, I mean, you were just grinding it, going head to head, right? Beating each other up, right? I mean, just getting on the other side of the table. And what I found was the opposite, that the more connected I was to the, to the equipment manager, the athletic director, the general manager, whatever it was, the more successful the negotiation was. And, and for me, 
you know, you might, you might negotiate a contract for a baseball player and you may get a deal, you may not. But the truth is I needed to have a good relationship with that general manager for the next athlete and the next athlete or for the, with the network for the next talent that was going to be negotiating. So for me, if you're going to go back and renegotiate with other people or on other topics, that's why that relational component is, is to me imperative. I absolutely agree with you. And I know how in everything that we do, especially in how women navigate through business, that relationship building and understanding what we can contribute is essential to moving forward and to being proud. And I would say, of course, loud and proud like a pushy broad, but still slowly moving ahead and making sure that I'm heard and also that I am respected and still respecting others in the process, right? That's sure. what it's all about. So winding down, I want to ask you a couple of really rapid fire questions. So just tell me what comes off the top of your head. First of all, what have I, what have I neglected to ask you that I should have asked you? Wow. I mean, you know your audience better than me. So, uh, you know, I think anything that would support, you know, I guess the, the one thing I would say, because I know you have a lot of women that listen is, um, you know, that I, that I love to sort of share is, is, you know, my husband and I have three daughters. We have a 17 year old and two 16 year olds. And, um, you know, is, is once something my mom told me and she said, you can't, you can have it all, but you can't have it all at once. She said, and it's in one of my books. And, you know, to me, it's important. So I guess I would just tell women, you know, be, be gentle on yourself. Um, you know, oftentimes women feel so pulled. And, and I think that the more that we have clarity around what matters most in our life, um, the easier it is for us to then say yes and no to certain things and ensure that the things you're saying yes to align with what matters most. And that's where that why, that purpose statement to me is so important. The more clarity you have on what matters most, the more that you can create the balance in, in your life, the more that you can have the discipline, hopefully, and the structure to say yes and to say no, but also know that you'll make mistakes. I make mistakes along the way, right? I say yes to things I maybe should have said no to or vice versa. And so just as women, I think we need to be gentle on ourselves. We're hard on ourselves. Um, and so just be gentle. That, that would be one thing I would add to, to women. Okay. So I know that you have three daughters. What kind of life lessons are you think the most important that you were imparting on them? A couple of things that you're telling them they should be doing as women. Yeah, for sure. You know, one is, you know, fail often, you know, just go for it and fail and it's okay. Right. Because to me, that means they're trying new things. That means they're being curious. That means they're being a little bit fearless. And that means there's the confidence in themselves to step into moments that, they don't have all the answers to that they don't maybe know how to do, but that's okay. That's where we grow. So if, if I can teach them to fail and to recover and to be curious, insatiably curious, one of the things that, you know, we talk to lots of leaders on my podcast and, and we always are wanting to talk about one of the things I constantly see with great leaders is, is curiosity. So if I can teach my girls to just stay curious, stay curious because that's what's going to open you up to your own gifts whatever it is that you want to do in, in, in this life. So curiosity to me and fearlessness and, and, uh, and embracing failure are, are things that I try to, they hear those words a lot. Let's put it that way. That's wonderful. I always tell my clients, make plenty of mistakes, but let's try to make new mistakes. Keep there you go. I like that. Mistakes. <laughs> That's because awesome. As you said before, doing the same thing over and over again and getting different results, you know, getting different results is kind of impossible. So I, I'm a firm believer in make new mistakes. I love it. I love it. And finally, could you tell us one thing we'd be surprised to know about you? One thing you'd be surprised to know about me um, oh, man, I I'm pretty open. Um, you know, uh, I'm horrible at relaxing, honestly, like it's something I'm working on, um, meditation I'm trying to do. Um, I'm a horrible cook. Uh, one thing you'd be surprised to know about me. That's pretty surprising. It seems what? that you would have tried very hard to master that in some way and, and, and started to interview, you know, famous cooks to make that happen. <laughs> well, I tell you, I know I, I, uh, that, that is the one luxury I haven't embarked on yet. And, and hopefully one day we can as, uh, golly, I, thankfully my husband's a pretty good cook. So right. that keeps me out of the kitchen. 
And finally, I know that you have a fairly brand new book out called The Energy Clock. Just give us a brief synopsis of that so that we know where to find it. Sure. Yeah, so you can you can go to mollyfletcher.com and, and the list of books is there. And, and, and you know, um, it, it's a book about how, how to be intentional about aligning your energy with what matters most. As a sports, you know, agent, what I found was athletes performance was, was based on being very intentional about where they put their energy. And then as I talked about, when I transitioned more into the business world, what I found is business people spend most of their thinking around where they put their time and not so much about where they put their energy. And yet I come from a, a world of for 20 years where I saw the linchpin to performance being energy. And, and then I got into the business world and I saw the linchpin to performance being sort of time management, right? Managing your calendar uh, where to be and when. And I thought, what if business people took the mindset that athletes took and recognized that performance was about energy management more so than, than time? Um, so it's a book. It's a quick read. You can read it in an hour. We take people through an energy audit where they can get clear on where they're putting their energy, energy drainers, you know, energy, things that lift you up, the things that drain you and the things that are energy neutral, how to be more efficient with it. Um, so you know, to me, it's, it's something I'm super passionate about. And it's been helping a lot of people, which has been is super rewarding. Not only helping people in business, but helping people on a personal level as well. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. No question about it. Yeah. I would say irregardless of the work that you do or whether it's in the home or um, in, a, in, a, in a business and setting, um, you know, the emails that we get, the, the phone calls, the messages, the, the, the comments on Twitter, LinkedIn, it's, it's pretty cool. And the book is available now on Amazon. What's on the horizon for Molly going forward? Yeah, so we're launching a, uh, a workshop uh, training program around the book. Um, so that'll be coming out pretty soon. Um, and that's going to be pretty powerful, right? It's going to be helping us take people even deeper than the book takes people around being effective in regards to managing their energy um, effectively. So I'm super excited about that. That's going to be coming soon. Um, and we'll keep people in the loop on that on all of our social media channels and all that. And then, of course, we're continuing to train people on negotiation, which has been uh, powerful. One more message you want to leave us with here today and Transformation Talk Radio listeners? Well, Alan, thank you for the work that you do. You know, women need these kinds of um, forums, if you will. And so I know you have tremendous um, people that follow what you do and are grateful for the work that you do. So thanks for, for what you're doing for women. It's just awesome. Thank you for what you're doing for women. You're certainly an inspiration to all of us. And I certainly will be picking up a copy of that book. Thank you, Molly Fletcher. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Ellen. It's a treat. This is Ellen Stewart, the pushy broad from the Bronx, saying thanks for listening. And remember, everybody needs a little push. From the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York.